A warm welcome to our second EU ASEAN thematic webinar organized as part of the Smart Green ASEAN Cities Programme, or SGAC, SGAC. SGAC is an initiative funded by the European Union, supported by the ASEAN Secretariat, and implemented by the UN Capital Development Fund, UNCDF, in partnership with FMDV, uh, the Global Fund for Cities Development. Uh, the program has been designed as a catalytic initiative to support the financing of sustainable urbanization across ASEAN member states, especially in middle weight cities, to develop viable financing mechanisms for smart green city projects. It adopts a multi-level collaboration approach, working together with the Secretariat, national and subnational governments, with currently 15 cities participating in the program. We hope to offer you through this webinar series opportunities to explore a wider spectrum uh, of innovative approaches, um, connect uh, with like-minded peers and practitioners, um, as well as to hopefully learn and possibly adapt some best practices. For information, just before we, beginning, uh, we begin, we conducted the first webinar on waste management financing last December. Uh, more than 80 participants from 37 cities across, across 11 countries attended the webinar. City representatives from Parma in Italy, Ljubljana in Slovenia, Slovenia sorry, uh, and Quezon uh, from Vyrane in Laos, uh, and experts from GIZ and GRET discussed uh, viable financing solutions for smart green city projects on urban solid waste management. You may watch the recording through our platform PAKU in five languages, English, Thai, Indonesian, Lao, and Khmer. Um, just before we begin, uh, uh, this is a peer-to-peer -peer exercise. Uh, we always try to have European uh, and uh, ASEAN cities uh, uh, displaying the progress they have been making, the innovations they have been implementing. Uh, and before we, we give the floor to our wonderful speakers uh, that jo are joining us today, just to give you some data, 80% of the countries globally reported insufficient financing to meet national water, sanitation, and Asian uh, access targets. And many countries in the uh, Asia Pacific region are lagging significantly in this regard. Water and sanitation have historically been financed by the public sector in Asia. Projections indicate that most countries in the Asia-Pacific region will need to allocate between 1% and 2% of their GDP. Ah, here am I online. Thank you, Denisa and Karina. Um, and uh, for water supply, sorry, between 1% and 2% of their GDP uh, for water supply and sanitation infrastructure over the period of 2015-2030 to achieve universal access to safely managed water supply and sanitation services for all. Um, however, public sources uh, of finance alone will not be sufficient. Uh, we need to mobilize private finance uh, and also uh, 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 to conduct a wide transformation of the, the way we fund and finance uh, public services. Water and sanitation utilities have distinct needs when it comes to accessing finance, in part because they require long tenors in, orders to, uh, in order to serve this debt um, while maintaining affordability for users, and also because they often do not have sufficient levels of operational and financial efficiency to provide attractive risk-adjusted returns on investment. I'd like to introduce now the, the speakers. Um, engineer Mathieu Third fernandez Arig um, is Assistant City Administrator in the Island Garden City of Samal in the Philippines. He's representing here the mayor of the uh, Island Garden City of Samal, uh, Al David T. Yui. Um, we have also Lika Leonardsen, uh, Head of Program for Resilient and Sustainable City Solutions, Copenhagen, Denmark. Thank you for joining. I think uh, this is very early as for me, for myself. Um, we have Jan Parker, Director for Asia of Espelia and Alison Woodhoff, Principal Water Security Specialist uh, at the Asian Development Bank. 
Before we start, I would like to survey the room with a short uh, introductory poll uh, and ask, um, according to you, uh, what are the biggest challenges for cities to finance water and wastewater management? Um, you can feel uh, the, the, the poll by clicking, but um, I'm not sure we can click. Uh, yes, it's for the participants. Uh, only for the participants, sorry. I, <laughs> I thought I could join the conversation here. <laughs> I'm a user too. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're getting the, the answers little by little. Please fill in because it's important also uh, as we ha process the, the webinar to have an overview from the participants of the region uh, on how familiar you are uh, to this issue. We'll leave you still one minute. I think we're good. Yeah, this is the result. Um, so we have the result here. Uh, okay, 70% of the participants think that this is uh, inadequate budget allocation for, from public authorities, then capital intensive with long payback periods, then, uh, oh no, we have 41% lack of data uh, for assessing complex water-related investments, then maintaining operational and financial efficiency, um, lack of financial incentives for private sector involvement. Okay, this is quite, uh, I think, the, the, the reality we know uh, in most of the countries uh, we, we've been working in. Um, I'd like to to give the floor uh, now uh, uh, to the speakers to identify the challenges and innovative solutions coming from cities. Um, we have a, a wonderful panel of speakers uh, representing two cities from the uh, uh, EU and ASEAN, um, not cities, but institutions. Um, that have developed effective approaches to finance their waste and wastewater water and wastewater sorry management. Um, this will be followed by industry specialists who will provide broader perspectives and highlight best practices and enabling conditions that are worth replicating in different geographies uh, and uh, cities. Um, engineer Matthew, uh, are you there? Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Um, we can, I think, begin with the first uh, very short video uh, from your city uh, to present and uh, show uh, your, your environment, actually. Very nice presentation. Karina, can we... Highland like city of Samo. A living embodiment of a tropical paradise. Clear seas verdant ridges, rich diversity of culture, a serenity with nature, an urbanizing center in a rural setting with competitive advantage for future investments in its typhoon-free climate, mm. strategic location at the heart of Davao Bo. Island for... Oops. I think there was an issue with the video. Um, no, actually, that's an end of the video. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, the oh. island garden city of Samal is a nine islet cluster in Davao Gulf uh, and is a renowned biodiversity hotspot. Um, recognized with the prestigious seal of good local governments, uh, governance for financial and operational excellence in the Philippines, 
the city confronts environmental challenges uh, due to urbanization and tourism. Um, and the engineer Mathieu Fernandez Arig uh, will introduce us to the environmental user fee, uh, which is, uh, uh, and, and together with the, the wide array of uh, long term plans to upgrade. Uh, all the facilities and public services in the island based on these uh, new financing source uh, to the work of the city. The floor is yours, engineer. Thank you, Sir Carlos. To Ms. Karina and Ms. Denise, uh, to Sir Jan Parker, our sector specialist, and Alison Woodrow. So to all of us here, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mabuhay and Majau. This is a greetings from Island Garden City of Samal. And on behalf of the city mayor of our city, I would like to express our gratitude and would like to say thank you for allowing us to share our, um, our best practices here in the city in uh, financing urban, smart urban water and waste water management. So as backgrounder, this is the profile of our city. Our city is uh, 25 years old. Okay. And we are in fourth class component city. Our total land area is 30,130 hectares. And we have a population of 116,771 as of 2020. Uh, population count. Then we have 46 barangays and 26,245 households. We have 112 registered beach resorts. Actually, our city is surrounded by crystal waters and beach resorts. And we have 1.8 million tourists arrivals. That's our peak arrival in the year 2019 before the pandemic. And uh, we are situated at the the heart of the Davao Gulf. Actually, the city is situated in the southeastern part of the Philippines. So, Island Garden City of Samal is uh, financing our uh, smart urban water and wastewater management, not only through our local budget, our 20% development fund budget, also from borrowings from other banks, but we have, uh, we have, uh, utilize our environmental users fee to finance our wastewater management and waste uh, urban water projects. So last 2009, uh, we have our city ordinance 2009-156, uh, the revenue code of the Island Garden City of Samal, which embodies the policy on the uh, on the imposition of the EUF. So that time, we have started collecting uh, 5 pesos for the environmental users fee that was charged to tourists and visitors to, to their use and enjoyment of the marine protected areas and other natural sites in the city. And it is unique that the finance or the funds collected from the fees or is a uh, ring fence and can only be used for environmental conservation, preservation, and other environmental concerns. Then as of uh, January 2016, uh, January 15, 2016, we have applied to DOT for the uh, regulatory impact assessment. So we may I ask for the next slide. So through that regulatory impact assessment, uh, we have improved our collections on the EUF. So from 2010 to 2020, we only have 11,589,000 uh, collection for the environmental users fee. But due to the uh, collaboration and uh, engagement with other uh, external partners, no, we have this uh, assessment. So as of 2021, uh, we have increased the collection of our EUF to 30 pesos. And then 2022, we have increased to 40 pesos and 2023 to 50 pesos. So that's why 
our collection on 2021 reached to 10 million after the pandemic. Then 2022, 21 million, uh, 113,000. And last year, we have collected 36 million, 879,217 pesos. So those funds are how we used for our uh, uh, financing environmental projects. So these were the stakeholders' consultation pictures. So we have invited our tour guides, dive operators, and transport operators, and port operators for the consultation activities. We have also invited uh, multi-purpose cooperatives, some of our groups, the, the beach owners, uh, within the city and the provincial in, uh, environment and natural resources office, the city officials and the barangay officials where, where the resorts are uh, located. So it was a fruitful activity and uh, very helpful to our uh, decision making on the uh, on increasing our collection and the rates of our environmental users fees. So this was the uh, the sequence of events happened. No? Uh, the inception workshop, uh, document review, and site visitation. So that was uh, that happened on April to September 2016. Then the stakeholders consultation on August 9 to 12, 2016, up to the drafting and deliberation of new ordinance. So on, on July 9, 2020, it was approved and confirmed by the Sangguniang Panlalawigan in our province on September 9, 2020. Then signed by our governor on September 23, 2020. So we have observed that the, uh, the drafting of the new ordinance started at 2016, but it was signed as a new uh, policy or ordinance on the year 2020. So it's 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 one of the challenges in in, in implementing uh, uh, policies that uh, it will take time and uh, on the approval of this uh, ordinance. So we have just implemented the new ordinance on the year 2021 because of that challenges. So. Next slide, please. So this is the new rates, the fee rates. So at, at the first year operation was 30 pesos, second year is 40 pesos, and the third year is 50 pesos in the year 2023. Then we have also given discounts to PWDs and children for the kids uh, 10 years old and below. Then last year we have improved the the payment method because we have used the online payment method through GCash and uh, land bank. So bank transfers we can use in payment. In payment. Then this were this was the graphical presentation of our the increase of our uh, collections no? for the year twenty from the year twenty twenty two to the year twenty twenty three. So as we have observed, it was it. It, it shows in, in, uh, a large increase in collections and it helps a lot in our city and in, in financing our environmental projects. So this were the list of uh, projects that was uh, uh, yeah, yeah. listed for the EUF, EUF utilization. First, we have in the environmental and conservation program. Then Environment Sanitary Services Program, we have Pollution Control Program, the Solid Waste Management Program, the Solid Waste Advocacy Program. We have also Eco Park Management Program, wherein our sanitary landfill is located. Then we have Coastal Assets Inventory Monitoring. We have Coastal Cleanup Drive Program. It was done every year to somehow maintain our shorelines. Then Septage Management Program also for the uh, wastewater treatment then for the loan amortizations of our projects uh, for in our environmental projects then we have also our environmental enforcement program we have our environmental uh, 
educators and environmental educators program. So we have these projects uh, financed by Land Bank of the Philippines. So as what, as what I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, our city is doing its best to to give what's what's what is the best for our uh, constituents. So our mayor have decided to not to rely on our local budget. So we all know all cities have limited uh, local budgets. The twenty percent development fund was used for the uh, uh, social projects, to educational projects, and other infrastructure projects. But to for our environmental projects, uh, the LGU have decided to engage in uh, borrowings. Then we use the EUF collections for the payments of its, its amortization. So it's unique because we, we it is a loan, then the amortizations were paid through EUF collections. So this is one of our uh, wastewater treatment facility in the island. It is an off-site treatment. Uh, this is uh, eight, eight years old uh, uh, wastewater treatment facility, an off-site treatment, and as well as this wastewater treatment facility is serving our sanitary landfill. So we have one dislodger trucks uh, for the for the dislodging of uh, sludge from the septic tanks of our residents and some of our uh, of our resorts who does not have its own wastewater treatment facility. So we have collected all wastewater and uh, brought to this to this facility for treatment. Next slide, please. This is our dislodging trucks, uh, one of our dislodging trucks. Uh, next slide, please. This was financed by the uh, EUF. Next slide. Our trucks and uh, this is one picture of our information and communication materials, the single-use plastic banning. And we have started our in, from our elementary schools and high schools for the information education campaign for the uh, single use plastic and uh, environmental protection uh, campaigns next slide please the target of our euf collection is to enhance through digit digitalization for this year we have uh, in partnership with adb for smart tourism we have received a smart tourism grant from asian development bank and this is our island a very beautiful samal a beauty a very beautiful city thank you so much matthew thank and you indeed uh it's a beautiful picture and this is a, a very nice uh attempt to renew the the funding and financing of, of your public services uh, we'll get back to you with the questions at the end of the of the session um i like now to to shift uh to a european uh example and uh, i'm happy to invite Lika Leonardsen, Head of Programme for Resilient and Sustainable City Solutions in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, Lika has over 25 years of experience in urban development, focusing on uh, water uh, management um, and green infrastructure planning. Um, as the former head of the climate unit, she played a crucial role in the city's ambitious goal to become the world's first carbon neutral capital by 2025. Um, she also provides technical assistance to cities facing climate change related water challenges through C40's Water Safe Cities program. Lika, I'm very happy to welcome you. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'll give you the floor now. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for, for having me. And as you said, Carlos, it's early morning. The sun has not risen in Copenhagen yet, but it's very, very cold. So. <laughs> Uh, but I'll give you a short introduction to both how we finance water in general in Copenhagen, but then I'll focus on what's my speciality on how we have uh, reorganized uh, the financing when it comes to uh, climate change adaptation. Next slide. 
And then just next, this was just an overview of my presentation. Next, yeah. Uh, the in, in if you look at water in, in Denmark, the, the water sector is semi-privatized in Denmark, meaning that most uh, utilities are owned by municipalities, uh, but they, they work in private. Um, they run on a non-profit uh, basis, I meaning that is that they're not allowed to sort of generate a, a surplus. They, they have to use the, in, in, uh, the money that they, they gain to actually invest in the development of, of, of their work. Uh, they, uh, we as, as citizens in Denmark, we pay for water through water fees or water uh, rates. Uh, which uh, uh, and we, you basically pay a price per cubic meter of water that you consume, drinking water, and in that is calculated also the payment for wastewater uh, uh, treatment and management and stormwater management um, in all of that. And in order to calculate it, most households are metered. Uh, uh, in Copenhagen, all households are metered, so you actually just pay for the water that you're using uh, yourself. And if you look at your bill, you can actually see how much is going for 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 for, for things like uh, wastewater management, etc. Uh, prices are also regulated, meaning that the utilities every year actually have to have um, a, a, a permission by the um, national government agency, the so-called utility secretariat, of what is going to be the level of their prices next year. So it's not a free pr uh, price uh, 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 formation in Denmark. Next slide. So when it comes to climate change adaptation, I mean, this is a, a big challenge for many cities that, that climate is changing. Denmark has just had the wettest year in, in our uh, recorded history. Uh, we've started also out January with, with uh, 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 a record uh, rainfall and so on. So it is really uh, uh, something that is on the agenda. And before 2013, it was very clear that everything that had to do with stormwater management was, uh, was for, for the utilities to manage. And whatever they were constructing had to be clearly visible, not visible physically, but it you have to be able to, to separate saying, this is stormwater management, this is something else, if you have like a retention basin or something like that. Meaning that most constructions from the utility side were gray infrastructure. Um, and there was also uh, the, utility, uh, the, the municipalities, they decide on the service level that they are asking the utilities to provide for the citizens. And in most municipalities, it is if you have a combined sewer system, like we have in most of Copenhagen, it's a 10-year uh, uh, service level, meaning that the, the, the system is supposed to handle a 10-year event. And if you have a separated sewer system where you separate uh, a stormwater from uh, the um, from the uh, uh, rain uh, from the, the the actual wastewater, it's a five-year uh, level. And that means that there was a clear separation between responsibility of the municipality and utility. Next. Next slide. Yeah. And then we had, yeah. C can you go back once? Sorry. Then we had uh, in Copenhagen a very big uh, 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 rainfall, a cloudburst in, in July 2011. And that made it possible for the city to actually argue that we needed to have a different approach. And we were actually also able to catch the ear of the then government in, in changing that. Next. And one of the things that we did was, first of all, also to look at what level of protections do we need to offer for the citizens in the future? And here we ended up by saying that a 100-year event uh, is actually something that would be uh, relevant for us because if you go below that, you will actually have uh, high damages. Uh, if you go above a 100-year event, the cost of preventing the damages will be higher than the damages. Next slide. So uh, in this, we actually built the, uh, the business case for the, the government in order to push for a change in legislation, uh, showing that surface solutions will be cheaper than underground solutions. I'll show you an example of that later. Change in legislation also to allow uh, co-financing of urban space improvement paid by the city through tax money. 
and stormwater management paid for by the utilities. Next slide. And these are the type of solutions that we have been working with in the city so far, making actually sort of like surface solutions where we are looking into creating, uh, using in existing infrastructure to manage also stormwater in these heavy rain events where we actually have flooding in the streets and so on. The idea was, can we control uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the, the stormwater on the surface so that we can control where it's going and, and, and avoid the uh, flooding that will damage property and people's lives and so on. Next. And these are just some examples. This is what a cloudburst street can look like in dry conditions and in wet conditions. Next slide. And again, this is a, a retention boulevard where you can see that the idea of this is, is not just to, to manage water, but actually also delay the water going downstream so that you are again controlling the flow of the water. Next slide. And then the whole idea of the financing was that the utility pays for everything that has to do with uh, um, with, with stormwater management. So, I mean, the fact that you're storing water in the street or transporting water in the stream, all these investments are paid for by the utility. But at the same time, this type of solution allows the city to actually make some improvements in the urban space, making the city look nicer and greener and, and with more uh, room for urban life. All of that is being paid for by the city uh, through taxpayers' money. So for each of these projects, the city will decide, will we add in extra money in order to, to raise the urban space quality of the work? Next slide. And this is an example of, of, of one of the uh, uh, cloudburst branches that we have in the city where we did the calculation and we have to do that every time saying, okay, what is going to be the cost of the surface solution in this project? And that's about 45 uh, uh, million euros. Um, and if you look at then what is the cost of the traditional solution, it's almost three times as much, uh, meaning that it's a definitely a very good business case to work with surface solutions rather than having an underground solution that is not bringing any good qualities to the uh, uh, to the city at the same time. Next slide. Um, yeah, and just give this, this is just the total price of our project. Next. Um, the impacts of water fees is actually that they will rise over a short period of time and then they will fall again. Next. And just a few slides, you can go quickly through these showing some of the projects that we have made to give you an idea of how we are creating urban space in, in this work. Next, yeah. At the moment, we are working on new rules. The government has changed the rules, meaning that we will actually have to work with a lower service level also for our climate adaptation work. And, and we are at the moment actually looking into, into how to deal with this. And it is one of the tricky things in all of this is the fact that you have to to actually also work with with uh, um, uh, solutions that will change over time uh, because of of economic development and so on. Next slide. And to end, I'll just have one slide uh, uh, on uh, to, yeah on 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 storm surge management because coast Denmark has nine thousand kilometers of coast and we are experiencing also heavy coastal flooding uh, in the, the last few months. Um, and we have a legislation which is not good enough for financing that at the moment, it is actually the people who are living on the coast who pays. Uh, but if you're looking at large cities, a lot of other people will actually benefit from that. So how do you actually then divide the cost between that? That is something that we need to work on in the uh, uh, future because we need to secure vital infrastructure like in Copenhagen we have the airport we have the metro there's a huge energy supply system that provides energy not just for Copenhagen but also beyond that so it, it is an important thing to do thank you very much thank you so much uh, Like and um, this is a very interesting example and uh, just before I launch a new poll um, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, who have you been working with 
to uh, identify this, uh, these solutions based on the planning of the city and, uh, and the financing part? Uh, is it internal, uh, internal discussions or did you get a strong support from the national government, advisory firms? How did it go? Um... I mean, there was it. The work has been done by mainly by the city and the utility in a very close partnership. I mean, that's really important that that has been a partnership. We have had help, or we have paid for consultants to help us develop this. Uh, uh, and 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 so it, when we started out on this this idea of having a cloudburst management plan for the city, we non nobody because nobody had done what we had were doing before so so we had no idea on on exactly how to do it so uh, uh, we uh, we 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 worked together we also i think it was very important that saying it wasn't just the people working with water management but it's actually also traffic planners uh, urban planners and so on who need to be involved in all of this because you are actually working and changing the way the city looks Thank you so much. Matthew, can I ask you the same question? How did you find this uh, solution with the uh, new uh, fee uh, coming from the tourism? Um, who helped you in designing the, the mechanism? In our city, uh, we have consulted our uh, stock, uh, stakeholders. Uh, we have the stakeholders consultation with our uh, city officers and also from the province. So it's an it's a collaboration of ideas. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we are launching a new poll. Um, if you can uh, put it, yes, perfect. Uh, before I give the floor to Jan and Alison. Um, so we'd like to ask you, which approaches do you believe hold the greatest potential for financing water and wastewater management in the ASEAN region? You have government transfers, blended finance approaches, grant philanthropies, uh, earmarked taxes, tariffs, user fees. And of course, you can uh, let us know if you are unfamiliar with the issue. Um, and uh, just so we'll have the, the two uh, financing experts uh, uh, giving us an overview of um, the actual solutions that are existing uh, everywhere, basically in the world and being applied in the region specifically. Uh, so you will have uh, Jan from uh, who is the director for Asia uh, for Espelia, an advisory firm. Uh, Espelia has a 20 years plus uh, experience uh, in supporting and, and advising decision makers globally, including the current sustainable water management project in Phu Quoc, Vietnam, and uh, the national policy uh, for water supply and sanitation in Cambodia. Um, let me check. So people are sti still answering. Give me one 30 seconds, Jan, before you, you start. <laughs> Please. Uh, I guess we're good. So blended finance is the best approach uh, together with the government transfers. Um, and equally, market-based repayable finance and grant philanthropies, uh, taxes and user fee, oh, user fees also, sorry, I didn't go until the end. So user fees and uh, blended finance together with government transfers. So we can see that basically this is what is being applied. Jan, can, can you let us know a little bit more about your experience in the region? Yes, thank you. Um, so hello everyone and very happy to, to be uh, taking, to take part to this, to this uh, webinar today. Um, so just maybe a, a few words, uh, Espelia. So we are a French consulting company uh we are um we were funded uh, nearly 30 years ago and uh, as you said um so we provide um some uh, multidisciplinary uh, expertise uh, especially regarding economic financial and institutional uh, aspects uh, in all sectors of uh, public actions so water and sanitation solid waste management uh, transportation, urban development, etc. So, of course, uh, we regularly provide some consultancy services for the financing of water and wastewater services. 
And uh, right now we are working uh, in several countries, including Cambodia and 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 Vietnam, uh, as you said. Um, um, and I'm saying this because one of the examples I want to, to present today uh, is about Cambodia. But uh, first, uh, I'd like to recall uh, a few uh, basic notions uh, about the financing of water and sanitation uh, services, uh, which may come up uh, in the discussions, uh, which it, which is directly linked also to, to your poll. So it's, it's good. Um, so these services uh, generate uh, various types of costs, of course, CAPEX, OPEX um, uh, for the main, from the main ones, and which are financed by what we call the three T's or the four T's, uh, depending on if we add a trade. But the three T's, the main ones, are tariffs, taxes, and transfers. Um, so the proportion of each uh, resources um, varies a lot uh, from one country to another. Uh, of course, tariffs are the most uh, predictable um, resources, uh, but they are uh, often constrained by uh, people's uh, limited ability uh, to pay uh, for these services. And generally, they are not sufficient to cover all the needs, especially in some developing countries uh, or emerging countries. So in this context, um, it is uh, considered that tariffs uh, should be set to at least cover, um, let me, Okay, to cover at least uh, the, the OPEX, the operating expenditures, and that the sector depends, and the consequence is that the sector depends on other resources, such as taxes uh, and transfers, uh, to cover, to fund uh, the investments. Um, and uh, one of the main reasons for this is that um, this is a really capital intensive, uh, well, the, the nature of the sector is really capital intensive. In addition to this, uh, the sectors uses also some repayable finance uh, to fund the investments uh, and to close the financial gap. Uh, but this option, of course, is also constrained by several uh, things and the borrowing capacity, uh, which is limited, and also the ability to repay uh, the, the funds. So, uh, what we see as practitioners is that the solutions uh, vary greatly from one context uh, to another, and that there is no single solutions, uh, nor any good solution uh, in, absolutely, in absolute terms. Um, this is about a combination of things. So you have several uh, levers to, for improving sector funding. Uh, one of them is to maximize uh, the value of the existing funding uh, by improving the performance and uh, optimizing the costs uh, of the services. So, for example, to have a better, or to to make a better rational use of the resource, to improve uh, the energy consumption, uh, staff productivity, etc., the non-revenue water, etc., etc., and also to have um, to optimize the investments and to implement some uh, investment planning uh, uh, to improve investment investment planning, which is really really important and resource consuming. Another lever, lever is to increase or better mobilize uh, funding for the four T or the three Ts, uh, as I said. Uh, for example, to implement some tax, uh, uh, some tax reform or tariff uh, to reform the tariff system, as um, uh, engineer um, Matthew explained uh, before. So this was a, a good example of this. And the last uh, levels, uh, but you may have other ones, uh, but in this presentation, I, I put the, to increase repayable finance. Um, this is the example I want to, to, to explain just after this slide. And also another lever uh, would be to develop innovative financing. So for example, uh, some climate funds, uh, some climate funding. Uh, of course, all these uh, different levers 
can uh, and also and must, I may say, uh, be operated uh, at the same time to improve uh, sector funding. Um, so, as uh, in the case of uh, Cambodia, um, an initiative uh, has been taken to develop a water development fund, uh, which is part of the third branch of action I have. I have just presented uh, increase uh, repayable uh, finance and uh, so just a few words uh, of context uh, so Cambodia uh, in Cambodia a significant portion of the urban in the small towns and rural population is supplied uh, with private with water by, by private operators uh, and these operators uh, have uh, much difficulty uh, to access uh, some credit uh, due to uh, various reasons, but mainly uh, the low borrowing capacity and also their lack of collateral um, to, 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 to give to the commercial banks. So also these banks are not very familiar uh, with this type of investment and they do not offer some suitable products to, to fund uh, water uh, and sanitation um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so of course, this is uh, this limits investments in the creation of uh, new infrastructure and also in the renewal of existing ones. Uh, when of course the needs are are, are very huge. So to to overcome um, these constraints, uh, a water development fund is being set up to consolidate uh, the various uh, types of financing that feed in uh, the sector and to mobilize some blended finance uh, to raise uh, more money um, and to feed, uh, to feed the sector. So uh, this is to be achieved uh, through the provision of different types of, uh, of financing products uh, and one of the main ones uh, are some guarantees uh, to reduce the risk of commercial banks and also to blend uh, finance to make a mixture of uh, some uh, loans, uh, commercial loans, but also soft loans and, uh, and grants. Um, and maybe to, to finish uh, on this, uh, this is a scheme uh, which has been uh, implemented in several countries, uh, including in Southeast Asia. Um, so <laughs> as I'm a bit new in the region, I don't have much experience of what has worked well or not. But what I've seen is that in Indonesia, for example, uh, it seems that the, the, the implementation of uh, what was called, not in Indonesia, sorry, in the Philippines, what was called the Philippine Water Revolving Fund, um, which was established in, in, to, to, in 2008 uh, with the support of USAID and uh, JICA. Uh, has achieved quite good results uh, in improving the financing of the sector. So, so yeah, there are several, um, um, how to say, success factors uh, for this. Uh, maybe the, the main ones are also to, to, to incorporate uh, into uh, this scheme to support uh, through some technical assistance to facilitate uh, the loan approval and the loan disbursement to accelerate them. So it's really important when you implement those kind of scheme to provide also some technical assistance to the commercial banks um, uh, and also to improve the governance uh, and to make some capacity building to uh, the local uh, authorities and the national authorities. Uh, so these are uh, some examples, but there are many other success factors. Maybe we will have the opportunity to, 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 to elaborate uh, after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, we'll get back to you with the questions. I'll get. I'll, I'll, I'd like to give the floor now to our final speaker, Alison Woodruff, uh, Principal Water Security Specialist at ADB. Uh, she oversees ADB's Water Operators uh, Partnership Program and has over 15 years of expertise 
in urban water supply and sanitation, tourism, and natural resource management projects in Southeast Asia, Asia, and the Pacific. Uh, Alison, thank you so much for being with us. Um, maybe you can put it full screen, the presentation. Sure, thank you. and thank you so much for the opportunity Thanks. to be here. Um, greetings to, to fellow speakers and participants from uh, Manila. Um, so for this SASP News presentation, um, I think you've heard a lot of the great points by previous speakers um, about some of the financing needs in the region. Um, so just to set the scene, uh, this figure shows what where we are in terms of access to safely managed sanitation. And that's safely managed sanitation is the benchmark that's used for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, which is having a um, improved sanitation facility that's not shared, um, where excreta is safely disposed of, either on site or conveyed off site for treatment. And as you can see for Eastern and Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Asian Asia, we're only at around 60%. So in terms of achieving safely managed uh, sanitation in the region, there's a long way to go. And that will require financing. So I think it was great to see Carlos refer to the statistics. Um, this was some work that ADB and OECD did back in 2019. Uh, estimating what the financing needs would be to achieve uh, SDG 6 um, and expenditure requirements from 2015 to 2030. And as Carlos mentioned, we, it's indicatively around, on average, about 1% to 2%, although countries can be up, such as timor Leste, it can be up to 5% of GDP. So the financing needs are huge. Um, so it's important to look at how to mobilize more financing, how to use existing financing more effectively, catalyze private sector financing to try and accelerate efforts to meet the SDGs in the region. Um, we already, Jan already very nicely um, presented the work on the three T's or four T's, tariffs, the transfers, tariffs, and taxes. Um, and the, the need for, and also considering uh, the financing aspect. So being able to bring in concessional financing from financiers such as the Asian Development Bank and other um, development banks and commercial financing. On the repayable finance, I think it's very much dependent on creditworthiness. And this is a big issue for our region. A lot of uh, util water service and wastewater service providers in our region struggle with creditworthiness. And of course, without being financially sustainable, um, private investors are reluctant to invest. So actually, there's a lot of capital wanting to go into the sector, but our challenge in the sector is, on one hand, the lack of enabling environment on the regulatory side and the lack of financial sustainability and creditworthiness on the utility side. Um, so in terms of access to finance, um, for the probably the least credit worthy, um, looking relying on grant sources, concessional finance, so financing which is below market rates for semi credit worthy, but um, to be able to go out to the market and raise um, finance commercial financing, as some of the examples I'll present, that really requires a high level of credit worthiness um, of of the utility borrowers. So the first example I just wanted to flag was the Philippines uh, National Sanitation and Saptage Management Program. This um, is a program that was introduced to significantly scale up investments in sanitation, recognizing that um, sanitation is particularly hard to mobilize investments. Um, Sanitation has particular characteristics um, that makes it what economists call sort of a, a public good. Um, investments in sanitation have significant public health benefits in terms of reduced burden of waterborne diseases. If we have improved collection and treatment of wastewater, they also have significant environmental benefits. And unfortunately, these benefits cannot be fully captured by um, ha individual households. So as a result, households tend to underinvest in sanitation and there tends to be a low willingness to pay. So trying to bring in full cost recovery tariffs as revenues to um, invest in sanitation is really challenging. So in most countries, there's an element of subsidies uh, required, um, at least on the CapEx, capital investment side. So the Philippines introduced this program, recognizing their need for government support to scale up sanitation. 
um, introducing 50% of total project costs, which is actually quite significant support from the national government side. And this financing is made available um, through the Department of Highways and Public Works, um, Public Works and Highways, sorry, uh, to uh, local governments, uh, water districts, um, to undertake investments. Support is also provided to do technical assistance to the feasibility studies and planning for sanitation investments. Interestingly enough, um, uptake for the program has been really has not been significant. I think there's about five or six um, uh, successful sort of um, applications, but uh, uptake hasn't been as anticipated. And I think that speaks to the huge uh, financing um, challenge of wastewater and the need for local government uh, to mobilize, to even mobilize the finance of other 50%. And that's where I think where engineer Matthew was talking about bringing in innovative financing sources, for example, using environmental fees so that lo local governments can mobilize additional revenues to um, pay their share uh, to undertake uh, large scale sanitation investments. Um, Cambodia, very quickly, I also wanted to flag another approach in Cambodia. Again, recognizing that element of subsidies, uh, ADB has had several projects actually with the Cambo uh, Cambodian government where the national government will borrow on behalf of the provincial authorities and they'll assume the concessional financing and on grant uh, capital investments uh, to provincial wastewater authorities. And then after the handover, after the capital investment, those investments will be handed over to the wastewater authorities to operate and maintain, and the, the provincial authorities are also responsible for the operations and maintenance. So that's also another way of encouraging investment through that national, uh, provincial, uh, subnational share of, of financing. Um, India, in recent years, has launched a hybrid annuity model um, of PPPs under its Clean Ganga mission. Um, and this has been a, quite an innovative approach to scale up wastewater investment and bring in the private sector. So they've introduced what's called a hybrid annuity model, uh, 15 years, where the private sector comes in and develops wastewater um, investments, uh, sewage infrastructure. During the, for the capital investments, 40% is provided during the construction period by the national government. And then over the remaining 15 years, uh, annuities of the remaining 60% are provided uh, to the private concessionaire, uh, subject to achievement of specific uh, KPIs. Um, and the operator also uh, receives an operations and maintenance fees. Uh, in terms of this model, although the government is, at the end of the day, pre preparing a, for financing 100% of CapEx, um, has the advantage that it spreads the government's uh, commitments over time. So they're only providing 40% upfront during, during the very initial years and the remaining um, liabilities in terms of payment for the CapEx comes over time. So that helps reduce the, the financial burden for national government. Um, I also wanted to flag a recent uh, PPP project in Uzbekistan for which ADB was engaged as a transaction uh, advisor for this PPP. Uh, it was a 90 million design, build, finance, operate, and maintain contract for wastewater. It was just treatment, so not the sewage network, with a 25 year um, dura contract duration. So, this PPP has been structured where um, the operator is paid based on a fixed availability payment. And so, making the services available, just having the wastewater treatment plant there. Um, to receive wastewater, and then they're also paid on a volumetric basis as well. So this model has, again, um, has the advantage of reducing the upfront invest investment requirements um, to of the national government or municipal government by shifting that to the private sector and then paying over the operations period. Um, one thing to note, however, is in this case, the sewage collection and network is not out within the contract. Um, often this is a more complicated um, to do a PPP is on the network side because of revenue risks, for example. So um, if a, a private operator is responsible for collecting sanitation tariffs because of the low willingness to pay, that brings in some revenue risks. So often um, for PPPs, the wastewater treatment side of things where you can easily ring fence and enter into sort of a take a pay arrangement with a municipal authority has, has um, helps overcome some of those risks. 
And then finally, I wanted to mention the Georgia Global Utilities Green Bond. This is a um, green bond issue that was done, uh, I think back in 2020, ADB was one of the anchor investors through our private sector arm. And the utility was able to issue a five-year green bond. I think the interest rate was about 7.75 euro bonds. And it was able to raise financing for their rehabilitation of water supply and sanitation. Um, so this shows another mechanism which can be used to raise financing. Again, in the spectrum of credit worthiness, um, this is probably a model that's more, most appropriate for the more credit worthy utilities, for example, and in, here in the Philippines, middle of the water, which is one of our the large private concessionaires raised about 500 million in green bonds a couple of years ago. Um, so this is also a good option for the more credit worthy um, utilities. So I also just wanted to end by mentioning, I think there's also significant potential for climate green financing more and more has been recognized that contribution of the sanitation sector to um, climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions is actually quite significant. Uh, methane and nitrous oxide from wastewater treatment are one, some of the, among the most potent greenhouse gases. So there's increasing interest in investing and bringing in climate finance for wastewater. Um, ADB has set up the green, Specifically for the ASEAN region, we have the green uh, ASEAN Green Catalytic uh, Facility, um, which provides very concessional financing for eligible projects. And we've been able to bring in financing into this facility from partners such as the Green Climate Finance, Green Climate Fund, the EU, uh, the UK, to provide very concessional financing for invest green investments, including investments in wastewater and water. And um, of course, there's other facilities, for example, ADB and the government of Japan have a facility to um, provide uh, subsidies, actually, where the carbon credits are then transferred to Japan, for example, to claim. So that's also a very attractive way of financing investment. Um, so there's this is just one example, but I want to flag that this is definitely something worth exploring as well for those utilities and cities that are looking at undertaking investments is exploring what sources, pools of finance for climate finance and green investments might be available. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, thank you for all these insights, especially from the examples coming from the region itself. Uh, very important. Uh, and um, we have a little bit less than 30 minutes uh, for the discussion and questions. I saw that there were uh, some um, hand raised. Uh, raised. Um, just uh, you, you can use the Q&A feature in the lower ribbon of your screen or click the raise your hand button if you wish to speak uh, out your question directly. Uh, we already have, I have a lot of questions to, to the speakers, but we already have uh, questions uh, to the speakers. And uh, maybe I'll take the one to uh, Lika. Is there any mindset shift that you needed to do towards the government partner or private sector or citizen when you introduced the new approach of doing the surface solutions? Thank you. That's a very, very relevant question. Yes, there's a lot of mind shift that you need to do in this process. Uh, uh, there was a lot of work done lobbying towards the government of actually convincing them that what we were doing was not trying to find a way to get uh, uh, utilities to finance urban space improvement, but actually trying to make things cheaper uh, for the consumers, the, the citizens, for, for, for paying for, for the necessary protection. Um, we got the help also actually from, from the insurance industry in that approach because they could also see that this was a, a, a good idea uh, that the uh, public would take a, a larger responsibility rather than what is the current uh, practice is, is basically that you have to make sure that your house is protected yourself. Um, you also had to to we also have had to work with citizens on getting them to understand that when it's okay that there'll be water in the street sometimes this is actually meant to be but it's controlled um it really helps that we have these good green uh, solutions where they can see that there's also an improvement when it's not raining that they actually get new green spaces and and areas uh, for recreation and so on and 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 finally there was a lot of 
interest from our own work need to be done with our different departments in the cities. Uh, uh, of course, if you are a traffic planner, uh, you get worried when you all of a sudden you have some people coming and telling you we want to use this street for transporting water and so on. So there is a lot of of of, of work in that process, and 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 the, the 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 thing that we tried to do was to say okay where can we find something that will also they can see as a benefit in all of this so that we can actually say yes it's it's maybe a change in the way we plan streets. But it can actually also give us an opportunity to to do some work there that is necessary from a traffic point of view. Thank you so much. Um, another question, I think it's a, a, a cross-cutting question for all speakers. Uh, what potential challenges or barriers exist in securing funding for smart urban water projects? And how can these obstacles be overcome? I guess we, we discussed a little bit about this. I'd like to give the floor to maybe uh, engineer uh, Mathieu um, and maybe afterward Alison and Jan on this question. We, we discussed about access, about the complexity of the financial mechanism, credit worthiness. Um, uh, maybe uh, Mathieu, um, how, how, what was the first challenges and barriers you identified and um, how the process of building up to the uh, European uh, environmental, sorry, uh, user fee, uh, how did you get there? Uh, thank you, sir. Firstly, uh, the very big uh, challenge that we got in the, uh, in securing financial support is the, uh, the requirements uh, we have applied for the SSMP last 2018 here in the Philippines, but we did not get any support or financial support from the from the national government. So that's why our local government have uh, uh, we've done our our own. Innovations, no, our uh, innovations on how how to collect local fees to somehow support our environmental projects and septic management. And and sorry, uh, how much did you get support from the political side to to provide this innovation to to go and and look for this innovation? Was it essential or was it more coming from the different players that you invited for the consultation and coordination in the design of the uh, EUF? Uh, in the design of the EUF, uh, it was an equal, equal coordination of the stakeholders and also to the legislators. So that's why it was... Uh, It was approved as an ordinance, so we have collected EUF from the visitors entering our city. Thank you. Uh, maybe Jan, can you comment on this? Yes, sorry. Um, I think it's... Uh... Uh, of course, there are lots of challenges and, and barriers. Uh, maybe one of one of them is uh, the, the the institutional and governance framework, also, uh, which has to be quite um, clear and stable. Um, and uh, it's really about uh, reducing um, the risk, uh, the credit risk exposure, and um well the risk of the private sector uh and to increase the confidence uh in the um well to lend or to to invest some money uh in the sector so um of course it's really about improving the business model and um taking some actions to improve the performance of the service and uh, another important um um thing would be also to i think to have um 
uh, a culture to, to 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 put a culture about the results um, to achieve the results in in the sector and in the in the utilities. This is really important to improve the confidence uh, and to attract more uh, private funds. Um, Alison, maybe you have a, a great experience working with the national government, the utilities. Um, how do you see these uh, challenges and barriers? And that, how, how ADB question. addresses them? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's actually something with something exactly what we grapple with every time we work with one of our uh, clients in planning water and sanitation investment. Um, I think that on one hand, there's sort of two key considerations. So for water and sanitation investments, on one hand, I think it's right sizing the investment. I think that's probably one of the big lessons learned for us. Um, over the past decade, ADB has really moved to on sanitation to something called a citywide inclusive sanitation approach. So in the past, there was very much a focus on centralized wastewater sewage treatment, uh, which is very expensive actually. Um, and trying to get cost recovery, tariff recovery for large wastewater investments is challenging, particularly for low income households who have limited willing to pay. So we've much more looked at right sizing investments. So looking corresponding the right technologies looking more at on-site sanitation, septage management, where, where appropriate, um, where which is lower cost, which is more uh, in line with being able to uh, get some cost recovery. Um, but of course, there's generally always a, a financing gap, a tariff financing gap with wastewater. So we, we do a lot of work with our clients on how to fill that financing gap. It either can come from say national subsidies, which I mentioned, cross subsidies potentially, because willingness to pay for water supply is often much higher than sanitation. So you can sometimes get an element of cross subsidy. And then actually it's great to hear what the work in Samal, because we are working in uh, Philippines and Palawan with a couple of uh, towns in Coron and Almido, and looking at exactly that, looking at um, tourism fees to cover the financing gap uh, as a revenue source for wastewater. So. Just to summarize, I think it's two things, right-sizing the investment, first of all, um, and then also looking creative, being creative and looking at how you're going to fill the tariff financing gap um, to make sure there's sufficient financing, not just for the capital investment, but also for the ongoing operations and maintenance, maintenance as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I guess we had a question, uh, a, a hand raised from uh, Fiona. Um, was it uh, for a question or a comment? Karina or Denisa, do you know? I'm not sure, but I think she has turned down the hand. So ah, she okay. might not yeah, have any more questions. <laughs> anyway, don't hesitate to raise your hand. I think it's important to that you uh, you have a, a, a nice set of speakers and, uh, and experts here. So don't hesitate. Um, I see Yahaya Shaibu. You can you unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself. You are muted. Or you can write your question on the oh, okay. Here you are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I am Shabu Yaya from West Africa, Ghana. And I was uh, in 2021 to 2022, I was uh, one of the UNCPF Green Ghana Project uh, Community Facilitator at EGRA uh, in Asante region, Ghana. Uh, and I was very, very happy to be part of the Green Business and to make the climate change very, very important for the world to know what is the benefit of a green economy and importance of green life. Sorry, can you repeat your question? 
Yeah, yeah thank you very much. I said I was one of the UNCDF and European Union uh, Green Ghana Project beneficiaries in Ghana. Um, I was uh, one of the uh, community facilitator of the program. Uh, I was very happy to be part of the program and then to make the country, the community very green and to bring green businesses across Ghana and the world. <laughs> so you are you are thanking UNCDF. That's nice. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Yahaya. Yeah. Um. Uh, so uh, maybe um, I I'll read uh, another question. Um, oh, that is an important one. Can you highlight any specific technological innovation that are influencing the financing landscape? for urban water and wastewater management? This is a key question because you, Jan, especially, you, you talked about efficiency uh, in the operations. Uh, this is a very key component, especially if, you, if, you, if we have a broader look at what's happening, if we consider uh, climate change, climate adaptation uh, uh, emergency uh, in most of the regions uh, and especially coastal areas, uh, for cities, um, we see that there is a strong push to uh, accelerate in implementing, uh, and this will go also with this uh, te technolo technological uh, innovation uh, and change in the way the sectors are organized. Alison talked about um, going from the universal service to more decentralized units uh, closer to the consumers also to make sure that the uh, capital investment at the very beginning is uh, lower. Um, how do you see technology uh, having uh, uh, its say in this discussion on finance? Jan, Alison, uh, Mathieu, Lieke? Maybe I'll jump in and take that one because I think it's a really interesting question. I think the technology, yeah, huge potential um, as we get more efficient, say, wastewater treatment, lower costs. Um, but also emerging technologies with water scarcity, I think there's increasing interest, um, maybe not yet in ASEAN reason, but in water reuse. And of course, um, with water reuse, you're not, um, water retains its value. You can reuse it for agriculture in Singapore. And actually here, parts of here in Manila, we have direct potable reuse. So I think, yeah, technologies are driving um, many interesting changes, which could have cost implications um, for water and wastewater services delivery. Also, I want to highlight nature-based solutions. So often this is a very promising technology, low technology, but it, in the context of climate change, flexible, ad, um, cost-effective um, adaptation potential, uh, for example, constructed wetlands in, in the use of wa in wastewater treatment, I think offers um, in the right context, uh, significant opportunities. So yeah, it's definitely technology plays a role in the, in the financing discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, just being, before giving the floor to the other speakers, uh, how ADB takes this question in the process? Uh, how do you identify, how do you follow up uh, maybe with uh, a market review uh, coming from the entrepreneurs, innovators, do you do this exercise or yourself or do you uh, go outside, uh, ask advisory firms, how do you work? Uh, because you, you are the, the main funder in the region and innovator in terms of, of funding and financing mechanisms. Um, and, and you are in dialogue with, uh, with those players around. Do you get this information from the, the, the uh, utilities, from the pro service providers that you are working with, or do you actively go and search for this technological innovation? Great question. Um, for about two years now, or maybe three years, um, ADB has launched what we call e-marketplaces. And this is where we uh, invite technology providers um, in water, wastewater, sanitation to come and present innovations uh, and even flood risk management innovations in the tech sector. And these forums are open to um, member, uh, developing member uh, countries. So all of our client country participants can come and learn about the emerging technologies it's open to ADB staff, again, to raise awareness of emerging technologies that are coming and offering um, 
potential for doing things, designing things better, providing, um, delivering services in a better way. Um, so this is something we do quite often. Um, we were doing it monthly at one point and hopefully we'll continue because the rate of technologies coming out is huge. We also have a pilot we're working, some of you may be familiar with Imagine H2O, but they are a provider based in uh, Singapore that uh, vet techn emerging technologies in water. Um, and we work with them to pilot those in ADB finance projects, again, to look at uh, how we can uh, promote and disseminate new technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, do we have other comments, Lika or Jan, Matthew? Yeah, I mean, I can I can comment. Uh, I mean, it. I think the the uh, the important thing here is actually how we are also going to combine technologies and uh, low. Uh, um, um, like nature-based solutions, low-tech solutions. I think that's, that's a, a very important thing. We have uh, lots of like small companies in, in Denmark and around the world that are producing elements that can help. For instance, if you want to redirect down uh, uh, spouts uh, 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 and, and things like that. So it is sort of a combination. I think the, the crucial thing here is that it is really important that we have the co collaboration between the private sector who are actually doing a lot of the innovation and the public sector who are actually saying, this is what we need, this is what we want to do. What can we actually, can we develop something together? And I find that at the moment, sometimes there's a difficulty in actually getting these sectors together to work together and because there's this, fear of inter, uh, engagement with the private sector from the public sector side. And there's also uh, sometimes a lack of understanding from how things move around in a political system like the public sector. So, so the, 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 we need to, to actually train to be better at that. That's a very important and key component. Uh, and it relates also with governance and how the dialogue uh, goes on and I guess uh, it will be very interesting to see in the coming years uh, and maybe you have this experience with the uh, the flooding uh, that there is a sense of uh, awakening in the community coming from the private sector because of the impacts of these kind of uh, uh, um, climate events uh, in the local economy uh, so pushing also maybe for uh, this a stronger dialogue uh, between public and private sector and exactly this question of culture and language and financing models to understand what is necessary on the public side and what is necessary on the private and find the common ground uh, yeah. and common, common denominator. Yeah, Yeah, I, I sometimes tell the story about, and that's just within the sort of public, semi-public sector of our utility that have been used to working underground, building, uh, I mean, very sewer engineer mind like, and all of a sudden they have to work with landscape architects on the ground. And, and I mean, these two groups speak very different languages. Uh, the landscape architects have a lot more like poet, poetic language and talking about lines and curves and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and, and it's really difficult sometimes for them to actually understand each other. So there's in all sectors, I think there's a lot of, of mutual learning to that we have to do in order to 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 uh, 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 adapt also to a changing world. Uh, but also in 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 all the new things, I mean, one of the things that we have been working with in Copenhagen is also working to get the uh, water sector towards net zero. Uh, uh, so I mean, and we need a lot of of work done in in, in innovation in order to do that. And this takes time, uh, both dialogue and changes in the structuring and design of the way people work in the different divisions and services in the in the local government, in the utility, and in the private sector. Um, we we are finalizing the, the the session, and and we should have we could have more time, but uh, obviously we are limited. I'd like um, to uh, launch uh, um, two questions, important ones uh, in the poll. Um, what key message will you take away from this webinar uh, based on the presentations uh, of the speakers? Um, uh, what do we need 
uh, uh, to support uh, financing for water and wastewater management, a strong political support, um, innovative finance uh, from uh, local uh, potential uh, sourcing, diverse funding methods, uh, methods for water and wastewater management, um, and significance of locally tailored solutions in addressing water and wastewater needs. Um, we have seen that um, obviously for building the system, for building the the uh, the confidence, like uh, Jan was stating, we need the national government to step in to secure uh, the, the the mobilization of of public and concessional public finance, but also private finance. Um, how do you see what what are your takeaways uh, from the 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 uh, speakers here, their experience and expertise. Um, I'll give you uh, 30, 20 seconds more. Um, so I guess it's quite tight uh, in terms of answers because yes, of course, it's a composition uh, <laughs> of all these uh, uh, answers, uh, even though the strong political support uh, need, seems to be uh, the, the, the first one um, then we have uh, very equally the importance of innovative finance uh, coming from the local potential uh, and diverse funding methods. Uh, the diversity and the hybridization of financing uh, remains uh, very important. Um, thank you for uh, answering this one. And the last one, um, how satisfied, <laughs> oh, I didn't know that one. How satisfied uh, are you with, um, uh, with the speakers and the content of the presentation shared during the webinar? Uh, not satisfied, slightly satisfied, mostly satisfied, very satisfied. I am very satisfied personally. Um, and uh, I think in, uh, in the coming days, you will receive uh, an email from Denisa and Karina asking you to give us uh, more uh, insights coming from you on what you would need for the next webinars uh, that will take place uh, in February and uh, March. Uh, one will be on uh, smart mobility financing and in March uh, on smart tourism. Um, so uh, we'll go on with this peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange and dialogue between Europe and ASEAN region. Um, all the resources of this uh, um, or, or of this uh, uh, webinar will be shared uh, in the Pakuru platform. Uh, I'd like really to thank all the speakers. Thank you so much for your great presentations, uh, your insight, very important insights. Um, you can see now uh, on the on the screen. Uh, the the feedback form uh, that you you can uh, uh, fill in. Um, also, uh, we'll send you uh, the link uh, for the Pakru uh, uh, platform. Um, just to sh to share, uh, basically, everyone is very much satisfied. <laughs> so, thank you again to to the speakers. Um, I'd like to um, tell you that uh, the uh, SGAC program will go on after this first phase. Uh, the program will end this year. Uh, it was impacted a lot by COVID, but there will be a follow-up. 15 uh, cities have been dis um, uh, elected to, re to receive the support uh, in the region. And uh, UNCDF and FMB will make sure that we duplicate uh, the solutions that will be implemented and the support. Um, and especially for, from uh, FMDV side, uh, we'll try to make sure that the connection between the experience in the European uh, cities and regions uh, is shared with the uh, cities in the ASEAN region. Uh, thank you so much to all the speakers, Lika, especially uh, now it's 9.30. <laughs> we are more or less uh, on time for, for the European time. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we'll see you soon, I guess. Uh, and uh, um, see you in uh, uh, for the next webinar on smart mobility. Thank you so much.